you're talking about what Git is and you say, this is Git, it tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Cool, how do we use it? No idea, just memorize these shell commands and type them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work elsewhere, delete the project and download a fresh copy. Um, so I would say that this is quite common. I remember when I first learned Git, I literally had a sticky note that I would just tape to my computer that had all the commands and what, what I should try. Um, but what we want is to avoid this, right? We want to have more of an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. And it totally makes sense that if you're just trying out and you don't know who to turn to, like having just a list of commands to cycle through is a strategy most of us have adopted. But in an environment like BrainHack School and Neurodata Science, where you have experts around who can come in and help you, where you'll be working on this continuously over a week or so or more, this is the, really the perfect environment to kind of delve deep and learn really about what these things mean and how you can use them so that we won't just have a list of commands, we'll actually have an understanding of how we can use them in our own projects. Okay, so I want to just really emphasize here because this is something else that I think uh, people get a little nervous about. It's if you're used to, even if you're used to programming maybe on your own computer or you're used to, you know, lots of different kinds of, of analysis things, Git may feel unintuitive in the beginning. And that's okay. Like this is a very common experience for lots of people that Git isn't easy. But this workshop is designed to help you get started because that's the most important hump you need to get over and it will become natural with practice. It's just like anything else. As you learn to speak the language, take part in the conversation, it will become more and more fluid. Um, and for mistakes, there's always dangitgit.com, which is a website that just chronicles some of the most common failure points that people get, in to get, get into with Git and GitHub. Uh, this is very common experience. You're definitely not alone. If something goes wrong and you're like, oh no, what am I supposed to do? This, there's a site where tons of people have had exactly the same problem and they have very common answers for this. Okay, I had to make this pun. Um, so if you're ready to get started, you need to have a GitHub account. I know this was mentioned previously. If you don't have one, just make one right now. It takes a few seconds. You can just go to github.com slash join and you'll be able to quickly make a, make a GitHub account. Um, and then the rest of the material, we're going to do a little code along um, with this URL. And I'm just going to exit the slideshow so I can pull it up for you. Cool. Maybe this is the first place to break for questions. Does anyone have any questions about anything in the presentation? Not really a question, just emphasizing how important is that tool and how truly uh, it, those experience of uh, uh, having to go back to some files a uh, while back and is, is uh, is always happening even when you don't think it will be. Yes, absolutely. And I did get a question to put the link in the chat. So the link is now in the chat. Um, okay, great. So I'm gonna minimize this guy again and we're going to get started. Get started even, you could say. All right, cool. So I just first want to uh, say we're going to skip setup because if you have Git installed on your local machine and you have a GitHub account, that's really all that's covered in the setup. Um, we're not going to talk about graphical user interfaces, so like GitHub Desktop or Git Kraken, um, because we're really going to focus this tutorial on the command line. And just as a heads up, why are we using the command line? Um, so you just spent an hour or slightly more learning about Bash and how wonderful it is. Um, and so you may be feeling really excited about using the command line. And if you're not yet, that's totally fine. Uh, but we're still going to stick with the command line for Git for a couple of reasons. One is that hopefully you'll get a better sense of how the commands actually work just by typing them along with me. 
The other is that we want to be able to use Git on any computer, including on things like Compute Canada, which you'll learn a little bit about later in the week. Um, and those won't have access to GUI. And the other thing is there are several GUIs floating out there. Um, and if you learn on one, it's hard to transfer that to the next one. So hopefully by starting with the command line, you'll get a solid basis for all of the different aspects of this, kind of the workflow that we usually use when version controlling your research. And then you can port that to a GUI later if you'd like. Okay, so let's say you have Git set up on your machine. The first thing we need to do is tell Git who we are. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split my screen so you can see this here and you can see my terminal here. All right, so Git records information. So remember when we talked about with version control, we wanna know kind of what happened at all these different steps. But we also need to know who made specific changes. And this is super, super critical, for example, if you're doing collaborations with several people or if you're working in open source, you really need to know who made a particular change. Like, could you imagine if you're working on a paper and you don't know he, who rewrote a particular section, right? This is something that's really important. So Git just needs to know who we are. And we can tell Git who we are by using something called Git config. Um, and this is gonna be something that you only have to do once on your own computer. So because we use this global, it's gonna apply to the system as a whole. So first I'm gonna say user.name and I'm just gonna tell it my name. So you can give it whatever name you want to be known by uh, in your version control history. I think it's simplest to be known by my real name. Uh, so I tell it my real name. And then I'm going to say, and one thing to note there that I have kind of noted on this is you do need to put quotation marks around your name. Otherwise, much as Russ said before with Bash where the spaces can become a problem, um, if you put quotation marks, then it will take your whole name rather than just taking, for example, your first name. Okay, so if we do git config global, we did user.name, now it knows our name. We also need to tell it our email. Um, and this is a way just because when we start working with GitHub, we want a place to be able to send, for example, notifications to have kind of a unique ID to track who you are. Because you could, for example, have two people named John Smith working on a project, but hopefully they each have their own unique email. So I'm going to give it my uh, GitHub email. And this is something that you can be doing in your own terminal right now, just to go ahead and get your Git set up. Cool, okay, so now GitHub knows who we are. We just need to do a few quick other things to make sure that we're set up. The first we wanna do is we wanna set a default editor. So Ross went through this a little bit last time. If you could use Nano in the last tutorial, I would say to go ahead and use Nano again now. If you couldn't use Nano, I have some alternatives here. Um, for example, Notepad, which Ross mentioned is kind of the graphical one you may be familiar with, or text edit. I also have VI or Emacs if you're used to working with those at the command line. But let's say that you could use Nano. So I'm gonna say git config global core.editor nano. And what this is gonna do is every time Git wants to ask us for a little piece of information, which we're gonna go into, it's gonna ask us quite often actually, um, it's just going to pop up this editor. So we'll quickly be able to type in something and save it and then Git will have that information. Okay, cool. So those were the main things we needed to set up. So now let's just check. Let's see what happened. So if we use this command cat, which will print the contents of the file to the screen, we can do this home. So this says our home directory. That's what the tilde means. And then this hidden file, this dot file, like Russ just told you about, called git config. And now it's got some information. So I have a few extra things, but the important ones are my name, my email, and my editor. And again, because we use global, I only need to do this once per computer. So that's why you're seeing this persisting some things that I've done previously. Okay, cool. Does anyone have any questions 
about getting their Git set up. Perfect. Okay, yes. And sorry, so if you go to what we're going to do, if we go to the home, you can see each of these are different lessons and we're going to just work through them. So right now we're working through tracking changes with the local. Awesome. Okay, so I assume that it worked for you and that you were able to successfully get a uh, git config, get a git config going. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and create a new repository. So the idea with Git is that a repository, you could think of it as a project. It's basically what Git is going to consider it's uh, everything within it belongs to one project and we're going to keep track of all the files in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to our home directory and then we're going to check where we are. So for me, I'm in home ENG brief. Um, and then we're gonna make a new directory, just like Russ did last time. And we're gonna call it git papers. And now we're going to change into that directory, git papers. And I did not just type super fast there. Uh, I just hit git and then tab to autocomplete. I may do that a few more times. So I just wanted to give a heads up that it's a wonderful feature. Okay, cool. So what we need to do is we have this folder and right now it's just a folder. It's not even a Git repository. It's just a folder on our desktop. What we'd like to do is tell Git that we want this to be a repository. So we want to tell Git, hey, you know, we would like you to pay particular attention to this folder. It's going to be one project and therefore one repository. So what I can do is I can just say git init for initialize and it's going to tell me initialized empty git repository in uh, the folder I was in dot git. Um, so what does this mean? It's just created this new dot git directory. So yeah, let's use the ls command Ross just went over and you can see it's got all kinds of things in it. Um, so these are all git configuration files. What's important here is you don't want to accidentally delete this directory. This is the folder that keeps track of all of your changes, that version control that we really want, all lives in here. So if this folder accidentally gets deleted or this directory accidentally gets deleted, then you lose your local copy of your version control history. Um, we'll talk about in a bit how we can make this distributed so that you don't have to worry quite so much. But for now, we really want to focus on not deleting this directory. Okay, let's say that's worked. So what do we want to do? So I said this is papers, you know, we're all in grad school or maybe we've recently been in grad school. So what would we like to do? We'd like to write a journal article, let's say. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and use that same text editor that I used in my config. So for me, it's going to be nano. And I'm going to say, I'm going to write this new journal article in Markdown, and I'm just going to call it journal.md, short for Markdown. And now I'm going to say, okay, this is my super cool paper written by me. It's a pretty good start, right? This is, this is usually how I start all my journal articles. Okay, cool. So we've saved the file. And you can check that just again by doing that cat command we did earlier. You can see that what we typed previously is in there. Great. All right. So now we have this uh, file journal.md inside git papers. But how do we know what git is doing, right? So we've created this file ourselves. We hope that Git and GitHub are going to help us to keep track of what's going on. So let's go ahead and just use something called git status and see what git thinks is the status of this uh, folder. And it's going to tell us quite a bit of information. Um, so you can see that the information in my terminal syncs up really nicely with the information here in that it says we're on branch master. Uh, this says, you know, we don't have any commits yet or it's our first commit. We have untracked files and it lists the file that's untracked. For me, it shows up in red. And then it says nothing added to commit, but untracked files present use git add to track. 
So what this tells us is a quite a few things, actually. The first is that we're on the master branch. So that's what it says here. Um, so master is by default the main branch that you're on in a Git repository. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about branches later, but you can think of them for now as parallel versions of a project. And every time you make a new Git repository, the default branch is just called master. Um, the other important bit of information I really want to point out right now is that we have this thing called untracked files. And what that means is Git notices that that file is in our working directory, but we haven't yet told it to pay attention to that file. So if we make any changes to that file, they're not going to be recorded in our version control history. Um, so this you know, can be useful if you want to work on certain files, but want to keep them outside of your version control. In this case, we really want to version control this, so we want to tell Git to pay attention to it. And to do that, we can use this command called git add. So what that basically does is it puts a little flag on our file and it says, hey, git, I want you to add this to the list of files that you're watching. So I can say git add my journal article. And now just as before, I'm going to do git status. And now I can see some of the information is the same, so I'm still on branch master, but the main thing that's changed is whereas before it said I had untracked files, now it says changes to be committed and it lists journal MD as this new file. Okay, so this is pretty cool, right? So now we've told Git that we want to pay attention to this file um, and we put it in something called uh, the staging area in Git parlance, we've told Git that, hey, you know, we're going to add this to our version control history. And it's going to pay attention to it um, until we do something called Git commit, which is basically just logging the state of the repository or the state of a file at a given time. So you can see in this little illustration, so for example, if we add this one line in green, so here I'm just adding a new file. That's one change in the staging area. You could imagine making several files and you keep adding them and then you're gonna tell Git, hey, let's note the repository at this time. But we haven't done that yet. All we've done right now is just add them here. Okay, so I wanna do one more piece and then I'm gonna take a break for questions. So, what we want to do is we've told Git, hey, pay attention to this. This is going to be important, but now we need to commit it. And the way that you can think about committing, so I said this is kind of logging the state of a repository, but it's not only logging a state of a repository for Git. It's not only kind of planting a checkpoint, it's also for you. So this is one of the, the reasons this is really a conversation with either your collaborators or yourself over time, is that we can really use this place to write information about what happened at a particular point in the repository in a way that we could quickly scan through later. So I can say um, git commit and what's going to happen is it's going to come up with this little dialogue. So for me again because I use nano it launches in nano where it says please enter the commit message for your changes um, and then it gives me a little bit of uh, more information about like lines starting with a pound sign will be ignored. So I need to tell it something, right? Like if I, it tells me that if I have an empty message, if I don't say anything here, that it won't be committed. So I need to tell it something about what I've changed. And what's great here is to make sure that what you write is human readable. Because again, this is something that you or your collaborators are going to want to be able to quickly glance back to later. So I can say initial commit of my new journal. Uh, that's too long. Initial commit of my article. And then I'm going to say initial title and author listing for my new journal article. So what this does, which is really nice, is I have this first line and that's the title of my commit. So that's where I said, ah, I don't want it to be quite so long because this is something that I could quickly look at and just kind of get a sense of what's happening. But then you have this description 
So you have a blank line in the description and the description provides you as much more detail as you want. So you can really see in depth about exactly what, what happened at a particular point in uh, whatever language you choose to express it in. So for me, I'm saying it's the initial title and author listing uh, because that's how I would think about it. So, okay, I'm happy with this. I want this to be my first commit. So I'm gonna exit my editor. I'm gonna save it. And then I'm going to go ahead and do just what we did before, our favorite command so far, which is git status. And now it says on branch master, just as it did before. And then it says nothing to commit, working directory clean. Okay, so what does that mean? Because this is a little bit confusing. Before we had, you know, we had untracked files, then we had changes to be committed. And then we look at this and we say, where did all of that go? Uh, what happened is that what Git is keeping track of is are there files in here that Git doesn't know about yet or that have changes to them that we haven't told Git about yet. In this case, we do still have our journal article, so we can do cat journal just to check, right? And it's still there, all the contents. Um, but we haven't changed it from when we did this Git commit. And so what that means is GitHub or Git rather says, great, you know, I have access to everything here. The directory is clean. I'm paying attention to all of it. There's nothing untracked in this directory, which is cool, right? So Git knows everything that we've done so far and it has a record of it. So let's say let's go, we want to go ahead and work just a little bit more on it. I just want to show you what happens if we change something again. Okay, so now we're going to do nanojournal.md and let's say we're going to start an introduction. So this is a very important problem that I have been working on. Yeah, this is going great. This paper is off to a good start. So let's save this. And now if we do, and I'm just going to clear my screen with the control L. So it's back up at the top so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so now if we look at journal.md, you can see my introduction was saved and I can do git status. And it's back to saying on branch master, but now it says that I've modified my journal.md. Which is good, right? Because before, if you remember, it said I had an untracked file but now it's still tracking journal.md, it's just modified. So let's do exactly what we did before. I just wanna show that this all still works. So let's add and then let's commit. Oh wait, let's just do one more get status just so we can see. So now it says it's modified, but now it's gone from not staged for commit to to be committed. And on my terminal, it goes from red to green. Perfect. Okay, and then we'll do a git commit. And we're going to say initial introduction laid the groundwork for discussing my big new finding. And then if we do git status, we'll see back again to nothing to commit, working tree clean. Okay, I want to take a quick break, uh, break there just to ask, does anyone have any questions? Let's see. And somehow I've lost my chat box entirely. Hmm. No, so no question uh, from Perfect. me, uh, Elizabeth. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, just, a, just a little bit there. of a remark of when do you commit and when do you not commit? Uh, uh, I think it's it's one of the things that is not uh, always well explained. When, yeah. when, when do you actually record things with Git and when do you not record? <laughs> no, it's a great question. So what I've been doing so, and sorry, I found my thing again. Perfect. Okay. So what I've been doing so far is I've been just making uh, kind of atomic changes, right? I've either been editing my title or my introduction and 
there's sort of a granularity to this. It's sort of an opinion question. But what I would say is really every time you make a unique change. So every time you do something where you're like, this is, you know, uh, reformatting or I'm adding a new reference list or I'm uh, changing kind of the documentation for this. All of these things that are sort of like, I can describe to you what I'm going to do, what this snippet of work is for, that should be its own commit. You don't wanna get into a place where you sit down and I rewrite an entire paper and I save that as one commit, because then if I wanna go back in time and I decide, oh, I actually liked the previous version, then it's really hard to break it down to say, well, I liked the previous introduction, but I want this part uh, that I changed in the discussion, you know, you've kind of made it too monolithic. Um, so if you can commit kind of atomic changes, you'll get much, much further. And on the other side, of course, you don't want to commit every two words that you're writing. So you really have to think in terms of like the what is the functional task that is uh, being done and where will I need possibly need to go back to it. Exactly. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to keep going then. So, okay. Um, so here I have a little bit of a, a, a cheat, but I'm going to skip that for now. So let's add a directory common. Let's say that we want to make a new directory inside of Git papers. And this is going to be maybe let's say uh, references that we want to reuse across several projects or that we're sharing with several people. So I'm now going to go ahead and in common, I'm going to create this file called references.txt. And I'm going to say uh, Smith, oops, sip, Smith J 2020, very important paper. Okay, so this is now, I can look at it and I can see that it actually did save what I thought. Yes, all right, so this is my, if I remembered APA style correctly off the top of my head, uh, very important paper that I should definitely reference in my very important paper that I am now writing. Uh, so what I can do is I can go and add that to this journal article that I've been writing. So I'm gonna now say references, Smith J. Oh, Smith J. Cool. So now I've not only added this references, I've also added it in my own article. And I want to tell Git that this is important, right? Like this is a change that I want it to pay attention to. So I'm first going to say, what is the status? And it's going to say, not only, if you remember, like last time, I've modified this journal.md file, my journal article. I also have an untracked file, which is everything under this common directory that I just created. So this is kind of combining what we saw last time, where we had journal, where it was originally untracked and then modified. It's staying as modified. And now we have a new untracked file that we just created. So we can do git add common, git status. And now what you can see is that we have in green, so it's correctly gotten this changes to be committed, this new file references.txt I created, but it says that journal.md is not staged for commit. So if I do git commit, what it's going to say is that it's only applying this commit message just to the references.txt, not to the journal.md. So here I can say, for example, initial commit of common resources include new shared references in common. And then I can do git status. 
and we can see now it's changed was before it said this new file and modified now it just says the journal ND is modified. Because what's happening is that when you add files right so like we said before you can stack and add files to get them into the staging area. Um, and you commit them and record those changes. But here, because I didn't add the journal.md when I, right before I made that commit, it's still not tracking that I made that last change where I added my initial reference list. Okay, so this was a lot to take in. Um, we all have now learned that git status is our best friend of a command, but there's just a lot of jargon that we went through, right? So we initialized an empty repository with git init. We use git status to show the status of that repository quite a bit. Uh, we used git add to put files in the staging area. And then we use git commit to save those changes to git's version control history. And we learned that we need to write a human readable message when we're making our commit changes. All right, does anyone have any questions about that? No, it looks okay. Ah, here we go. So let's see what this says. Um, if I start over, will I end up with several .git repositories? I had to close the shell window. Ah, yes. Okay. So if you start over, let's say, let's just try it first. Let's say we're in here and we do git init. What's going to happen? It says reinitialized existing git repository. So what that means is now, uh, if you use, we'll get to that one next, yes. If you, if you check and see what's happened, it's still, and we're going to go through that in a second, but it's still listing uh, what you had done before. So if we do git status, yes. So it's still keeping what we had, um, but you shouldn't need to do git init multiple times. It's trying to be clever. It's just that you only need to do git init when you make a new repository for the first time. Every time after that, you can just go into that repository and do git status, and it should just pick up exactly where it left off. Um, okay, does hopefully that answers your question, Ziad. And then if you use git commit A, will the message change? So if you use git commit A, what that's going to do is commit all the files in your uh, present working directory that have previously been added. So I'm going to abort this commit message by quitting, right? So there we go. So if you see that I did git status, it's saying that journal MD is uh, modified. And so if I do git commit A and do a commit message, it will be applied to journal.md. If I were to make a new file right now, let's say, nano new file.txt. Okay, and then I did git commit A. This would only apply to this journal.md because it's been previously committed. It would not apply to the new file.txt. Perfect. Okay, and then I'm going to do the thing that Ross talked about last time where you RM to remove the file. Okay, um, in terms of accessing timestamps, we're going to get into that in the next uh, little bit. So I want to keep on going. Um, the last time when you did git commit, you were just committing changes for the common directory. Yes, exactly. So the last time, if you remember, what I did was I did git uh, add. Here we go. Git add common. I did my git status and it showed changes to be committed were just common, the references. And then I did git commit. So what's really important to understand here, and I think this is something that throws everyone off in the beginning, is unless you add before you commit, those changes are not recorded. So I can keep making changes in my directory. And if I don't add them before committing them, the commit will, be, will, not, have, will not refer to anything. Right, so the commit refers to specific files um, that you have added as like this needs to, uh, this commit message is attached to these files. Okay, so I do want to keep going. 
because there's so much fun. How could we stop? Um, and I think this is going to get closer to the next question we just had, which is we want to start looking at history and differences. So I cheated a little bit and used a command you haven't seen yet, um, but now you're going to learn it. Okay, so let's go ahead and say uh, we want to see what's going on with um, what we've done in the past, right? So just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to go ahead and add another change to my journal.md, just for fun. Um, so let's say I added one reference and I've forgotten one, right? Like I, I realized there was this other really important paper um, and I'm going to call it, oh my gosh, um, I'm going to call it Ross's paper because that's, I'm, I'm having a moment here. Okay. If that is the hard part of Git GitHub for you is coming up with a fake paper title off the top of your head, it's a good place. Okay, now, so I've edited this. Let's do git diff this. Whoa, we got a lot of output here. What does it mean, right? So this is, this is really nice because we get a really fine grain about what's happening. So here we see that uh, it's telling us it's diffing between um, the same file, journal MD and journal MD. And we can look and see what it's doing is it's got all these little pluses. And what those pluses mean is that a line was added. So if a line had been deleted, there would be minuses. And if your terminal is colored like mine, it would also be in red. Um, so this is really cool, right? Now we can see exactly what's changed between the current file and the last commit we made. So git diff by default is just going to tell you the difference between the current file and the last command. You can also uh, supply commits, particular commits, um, and you'll learn how to get those hashes in just a minute or those numbers in just a minute. Uh, but it's really, really nice because I can say, oh, you know, I can't remember what I've changed since the last time I committed. Let me just do a quick git diff and it will tell you exactly what you've changed. Okay, cool. So now we're going to say great. I'm going to get add journal and then I'm going to get commit. And now that I've seen this, I remember that this is just about references. So I'm going to say initial commit of references adds the reference section with Smith and Markello. Awesome. And then it's going to say great. And then here it's going to give us this little series of letters and numbers. That's going to become important in just a second, and let's see why. Okay, so let's say we've made a couple of commits now. I'm not sure about you, but I'm already starting to forget all the commits we made. Um, hopefully your short-term memory is better than mine. So what's nice is that Git will actually tell us. We can go and look and see. So let's just do Git log. And what that's going to show us is every commit we've made so far to date. So we can see we did this initial commit of references, uh, initial commit of common resources, the initial introduction, and the initial commit of the article, as well as all the longer messages where we actually explain to ourselves what was happening. This is really nice just to look at. Um, and what Git's telling us is some very specific information about all of these. So remember how I said this little train of numbers and letters? That actually matches up right here. So this is the full something called the commit identifier or the version number that uniquely identifies this commit out of all other commits. Um, it also tell, and this is the short version of that. It also tells us for every commit who the author was. So remember again, we need to tell Git and GitHub who we are. Um, it's taking that information and it's putting it right here. It tells us when we made that commit, um, the date and the time, which is super useful. Uh, I think someone had just asked how you see when things were done. And it also tells you the commit message. So this is really great because now we have a, a easy way to access a whole record of everything we've done. And as I told you previously, what we can do with git diff now is we can see the difference between actual previous commits. So if I say, okay, I want to git diff and I'm going to choose this commit, 
where I did my initial introduction, what that's going to do is show the difference between the current version and this commit. So let's just look at that. And it shows that I added in common references.txt this uh, a loosely APA formatted reference, as well as adding the reference to my introduction. So that's what was done between when I first added the introduction and the current version. And indeed, if I look at the more recent commits since then, that makes sense with what I would have expected. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Let's see about this. Here we go. Um, yes, we're gonna get to version control of binary files later. Um, but it is, it is a good question. Yes, I, I would say though for the short, if you want an answer right away, the short answer is exactly what JB said. You just wanna do plain text files. Perfect. Okay. Great. Okay. So, and then what we can do is again, so we did git diff and it gave just one commit. Um, so we can also do git diff between, let's say, this one, which is the oldest commit, the initial commit, and then this one, which was our second commit. And we can see that in between, you can see with the little pluses that we added this initial introduction. This is really nice, right? So this is, means that we get a really fine uh, level of granularity about what we changed at each point. And then this gets into JB's point of how often do you want to commit. But for something like this, where I'm like, I'm writing clearly defined steps, this is really useful to be able to see what's going on. Okay, I'm gonna clear this again, and then I'm gonna do git log just to show everything one more time. And now the other nice thing about version control is let's say that I realize that I don't like my references. So what I can do is I can actually go and git checkout a previous commit. And it's gonna tell me that I'm now in this detached head state. Um, we're going to get to that a little bit later, but what I just want to show you is that if I now do cat journal.md, you can see, or maybe I'm going to control L and then do it again so it's at the top of the screen, you can see that now the references are gone because I checked out a previous commit where I had not yet get committed the references. And so now if I go and look at this commit, it's exactly the state that my repository was at a previous point. This can be super, super useful um, because you can quickly go through and grab uh, what your, for example, paper looked like um, maybe before you sent it off to co-authors or, you know, right when it came back from the first round of revision. So what if you say, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. I really wanted my references. Uh, how do I get back to them? No worries, because Git has this whole record of version control. We can do just Git checkout master. Remember that master is the name for our main branch. So that's going to take us to our most up-to-date point. And it's going to tell us that now uh, we're at the, the end of the branch. We're at the most common thing. So if we do cat journal.md, you can see that our references are back. So this is great because now we can not only see everything that we've done in terms of our commit history, we can also access uh, the state of a repository at any point in time when we previously made a commit. And then we can quickly jump back and forth between those states and the most current state, um, which is great. So yes. The, there's a one little note here, which I do think is important and could be confusing to folks. If you create a Git repository within another Git repository, so if I created, for example, here, I have common. So if I changed into common and I did Git init here, it would be pretty confusing because now not only is my Git papers a Git repository, common is Git repository, and then you've got this interesting nesting effect uh, where you're tracking multiple things at once. So just for organizing your own project folders and your own life, it, it helps to think about, okay, each 
separate project is going to be its own Git repository, and I'm not going to nest them one inside the other. Okay, I want to quickly check in and see how people are feeling. Um, but I do want to just remind you, this, so the key points from this are that we've now learned not only kind of the workflow of working with Git, which is what we did last time of status, add, and commit, We've also learned how to actually see what we've been doing uh, by showing the commit history with git log. We can also display exact differences between commits using git diff, and we can git checkout to go check out what the repository looked like at a previous commit point. Um, okay, so that I think is pretty cool. Ah, okay, yes. So Emily asks a great question, which is just a bit confused where this is being saved. Is this locally or on a cloud thing or something totally different? That's a great question. So what's happening right now is we're just using Git. And we have not touched GitHub at all. GitHub is where things start to get fun and uh, distributed is what it's called. But we, right now, we're just doing things locally on your computer. So remember that I said that if you delete that hidden .git directory, everything is gone. That's because it's only right now on your current computer. It's all just being saved locally. What we can do is think about how can we get this to other people's computers um, or to the cloud, and that's what we're gonna work on next. But for now, this is all just local. Okay, perfect. Let's see what else. Okay, Ziad is having issues with text editing, but it looks like Basil and JB are helping. Um, and then let's see what the last one was. Ah. Yeah, Edouard asks, can you commit only part of the changes in one file? Yes, so I'd agree with Basile that there are ways to do this. Um, I would say, for now, we're not going to recommend it. Uh, I have worked with that a bit with some folks, and it, it does get really confusing really quickly. So this is one of the nice things, if you can think about kind of when you're making changes to do it atomically. I find at least it helps structure my workflow, and it then makes my Git history much easier um, to work with. But yes, if that's something you need to do, there are ways to do it. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I want to talk now about branches um, because this can be really, really important, particularly uh, if you're working with um, different, let's say, versions of the same project. So let's say you you're considering framing the introduction in two different ways, and you want to figure out how you can uh, do both of those using Git. So if we do, I'm going to clear my terminal again with Control L. So if we do just a Git status with a space, again, we can see that we've got this on branch master. And what we wanted to do last time was we did git checkout master to get to the most recent version. So master is, as I said before, just the default on git. I don't really know why it is, but it is. It's just one of those jargon things that everyone's agreed is kind of the way it's going to be. Um, so what's really nice, though, is that doesn't have to be the only branch we work with. Um, so even though it's the default, we can add new branches and we can use those branches to kind of organize how we're working. So like I said before, maybe one good example is that you want to uh, have your introduction and you're considering framing it two different ways. Let's say there are two threads in the literature, they're both really important and you're not sure which one to highlight first. So you could actually have two different branches where you try out um, both of those different ways of framing your introduction. And that way you can kind of track both of them separately and then either merge them together later or delete one if you decide you don't like it. So how do we actually do this? So first we can do something called git checkout. Um, and you may remember git checkout is what we did before when we wanted to get back to the most recent version of the uh, 
repository or when we wanted to get to a specific commit. But if to get checkout, we add this B argument, that's short for branch, and that means that we can now check out a new branch, so a new parallel copy. Um, and let's say I'm going to call this paper with John. And now it's going to tell me I switched to this new branch, paper with John. Um, so this is a nice way to be able to say, okay, this is a different parallel copy of my paper, and this is the one that John and I are working on together to try out some new changes. So what's cool is if you say git, if you spell it correctly, and you say git branch, git will tell you with this little asterisk which branch it is currently on. So if we go ahead and we now make changes, oh, I'm still in common. And that's just what I did was I changed up one directory. Um, so now if I make changes to journal, I can say written by me and John. So, and I'm going to change the title to reflect that we're all working together. Okay, cool. So now I can do a git status again. I can see that I've modified my journal.md. Um, if I do git diff, if you remember, for this file, it will tell me exactly what I changed. So I deleted the lines, this is my super cool paper, and I added this is our super cool paper. Um, so this is really nice. Everything is lining up with what we did last time. So now what we need to do is, if you remember, we've get status it, but we have not staged it for commit. So we need to git add journal.md and we need to commit. And I'm going to say, I modify title and add John. And then I'm going to write a slightly longer message, make title more inclusive of co-authors and added John. And I'm going to save this. Um, cool. So this looks great. So if I just do just a cat journal.md, it's going to show me exactly what I have. It's written by me and John. Let me clear my terminal so it's at the top. If I do a git log, it's going to show this most recent commit that I did. Okay, this is all great, but I've been working on this version in parallel. What if I want to go back to my original? I can do git checkout master, which again, remember, is the other branch that I can see when doing git branch. And now I can see I've changed because of the little asterisk. So now if I do cat journal.md, you can see this is the version where I'm writing it by myself. So I now no longer have John as my co-author. I just have uh, myself. So this is really nice because I now have both versions working in parallel. Um, and they share the same history up until the point where I created that new version. It doesn't delete um, the previous copy. It keeps it available so that I could go and quickly switch back and forth between them and I can try out the two different threads. Um, so this is really pretty cool, actually. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Chat. Great. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Transition to using Git and writing up a manuscript when requesting using Word and its important features like reference managers and in-text citations. Yes, I agree. Let's save that for the general Q&A. Are the notebooks sufficient, self-sufficient for the content review? I don't think I entirely understand that question. Sammy, could you maybe clarify that question? Um, and then uh, Sivania asks, how do we add another person to a branch? Ah, good question. Okay, so this gets back to the point that we said just before, which is that this right now is all on our local computer. So even though I've theoretically added John, John isn't able to access this in any way. Um, because it's just occurring on my local computer. So if I want John or anyone else to have access to this, I need to move it off my local computer and to a distributed system. So how do I do that?
we're going to do GitHub. This is so exciting. This is the one that everyone's been waiting for, for how can we actually collaborate and work in a distributed fashion. Um, I want to give maybe a five minute break only because I think that this is a lot of information for folks to cover. Um, so let's even say like a three minute break. Let's start back up at 3.30. And that way people can just maybe stand up, go to the bathroom, something really quickly. And then we're gonna go to GitHub and there we'll practice everything we've learned. And now we'll work with other computers. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, see, you, see everyone in a, a few minutes. And uh, Ziad, I will, we will uh, try to solve your question during that time. Yes, I was gonna say, I'm still on if anyone wants to ask questions. Let's see. Uh, just to clarify, um, uh, it's Ziad speaking. Yeah. Should, should I wait until we're done with GitHub to uh, figure out my problem or should I ask now? You, why don't we try, can you ask now and then we'll see okay. how far we can get in a couple seconds. All right. Um, so basically, uh, I keep running into the same loop where I have to uh, just um, access .git, and then once I'm there, uh, I try to git commit uh, into the, the repository that I created, which was uh, git papers. Mm -hmm. And every time I try to git commit, it opens a text editor, and um, I basically just uh, type uh, the message, so add title and authors. Mm -hmm. I tried to type it before, I tried to type it after, with or without the, uh, the sort of um, hashtag before. And uh, it makes no difference. Every time I do that and save um, the text editor, um, I end up with the, um, the original uh, shell window not responding. So I tried to do a control C, it works. I get a prompt after that, but it still makes no difference in the commit. So what are you using as your text editor? It says text editor. So I think it's just the basic Mac text editor. Okay, can you try and change it to nano like we did in the... Um... Um, it does that automatically when I uh, type git commit. So do I have to type nano git commit or? No, so remember when we did, so I clicked back on home and then I clicked on tracking changes with the local repository. Mm -hmm. So we did this thing, set a default editor. Okay, all right. Can you do okay. this line, this right. git config global Corda editor nano? And you can do this line anywhere in, 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 your, in your shell. I mean, you don't have to be in the, in the uh, Git re, uh, repository. Exactly, right. And, and that's because we have this global. So this is uh, just as before when we set the username and email, this is something that's global across your whole system. So you only have to do it once for a new computer. Right, try with that, thank you. Yeah. And yeah, I think we think we think uh, yeah, that it's because the editor is not closing for some reason, and therefore Git is waiting for your editor to close. And if you control C in the in the in the shell, what happens is you actually do close the editor, but you haven't saved whatever you've uh, you've entered in the editor. I think uh, that seems to be the most likely which is happening. So that's why uh, that editor is maybe confusing of how it, it closes <laughs> and uh, changing that editor to something that is less confusing, maybe nano or whatever, uh, would be uh, a good solution. Okay, we're back at 30. Um, let me see if I can pull up the chat. Right but uh, just to finish, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, no, that no. Was like for Ziad, um, uh, I think it might be more useful for you just to follow closely what uh, Elizabeth is saying and then we we'll, uh, I mean, you can have uh, with the material you can actually go back and redo things uh, yourself uh, so I would uh, recommend if you're not uh, solving that editor problem uh, soon to just follow uh, as much as you can the lesson without uh, typing in uh, that's uh, that's probably the, the best at, at that point okay I just managed to do it with nano thank you so much I'll keep going with the lesson great excellent well done Okay, perfect. All right, so we're at 31. I'm gonna hope everyone's back. Um, and here to learn about how we move to distribute it. This is great. Okay, so what we wanna know is we've been talking a lot about Git. 
Um, but I promised you we weren't just going to learn about Git, we were also going to learn about GitHub. First of all, what is GitHub? Um, this is one of those questions like, what is the cloud? So GitHub is a company, right? And what it basically does is it provides servers where you can store your Git repositories. So you can not only have a copy on your local computer, you can also have a copy on their company servers. GitHub is not the only company that does this, right? This is a pretty amazing idea. So lots of people have gotten in on it. Um, there are other services available. Just two of the most common ones other than GitHub are probably GitLab and Bitbucket. And all of these major services offer a lot of really useful features. So you can browse code from within your web browser, um, which makes it much more accessible to anyone. It will highlight the code appropriately so you know what you're looking at. And once you start doing a lot of software projects, it also does really good things like release management. Um, it does a really amazing project management tools. We'll talk more about project management on Wednesday, but just know that GitHub is A plus for it. Um, and it also does issue and bug tracking. Um, so this could be, you know, for software or if you make uh, your repository, your manuscript, sorry, on Git and GitHub, this could be a way to kind of track what you have left to do in your manuscript. So it isn't the only remote repository of a provider, but it is by far the most popular one. Um, it, because of that in part, it's gotten a lot of really amazing functionality because it has so many users pressing on it. Um, for example, they can do things like make your code citable, which is really, really useful in many contexts. You can get a DOI and ask people to cite your code when you, they use it. Um, so because how popular it is, because it has all these features, we're going to focus on it in this tutorial. Most of these things will carry over to other providers like GitLab or Bitbucket or GitT or whatever is your favorite. Um, but we're really just going to focus on GitHub here. Okay. So you first need a GitHub account. I hope you made a GitHub account. Um, they're really great. You really, really, really should make one if you don't have one yet. All right, so what do we need to do? We need to go to GitHub. What? This is not gonna be in the terminal at all for now. So first we're gonna go log in to GitHub. Um, don't worry about my 2FA settings. Okay, so if you actually, if you have not gone to GitHub and logged in before, it will tell you something uh, about like this, where it asks you to give your username and your password. Hopefully, because you just made this account, you should know what your username and password are. And then when you log in, you may see something like this. Um, so what this looks like for me is that I have kind of a news feed of activity, tells me what people are doing. For you, this may be empty. Um, it tells you you can explore some repositories. You've got little notifications. You've got yourself. Um, and if you click your profile, you should see kind of your face, maybe without a picture yet. And it, maybe it's blank, right? Because we just made it. There doesn't need to be anything here. But what do we want to do? We want to make a new repository on GitHub. Because if you remember, we've been doing all of this locally, and now we need to sync it to GitHub servers. And the way to do that is to tell GitHub that we want a new repository. So there are several ways you can go about doing that. One is to go to this little plus thing and say new repository. Another is to go over here to repositories and click new. Choose your favorite, it's totally fine. Um, and because I get easily confused, I'm not sure if you do as well, I really like my remote and my local repositories to have exactly the same name. So I'm going to call it Git Papers because that's what I named it locally. You don't have to do that, but life is much simpler if you do. So I'm going to say uh, this is a public repository because I really want everyone to read my wonderful, amazing paper as I'm writing it. Um, and I'm not going to worry about any of these steps because as it says, I'm importing an existing repository. So I'm just going to click create repository. And then it should come up with this long thing. Um, and this is actually GitHub being incredibly helpful because it's telling you exactly what you need to do to get your 
uh, repository on your computer onto GitHub. Many people have had these questions many times before. So we're just going to listen to GitHub. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this, push an existing repository command line, and we're going to look at these commands and we're going to see what they say. So the first says git remote add origin and then this address. So this is a web URL, right? If I were to copy and open this in a new tab, it would take me exactly where I am. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this first one. And what this is doing, there's a lot of jargon here, but I'm going to, you can read it almost out of order. I'm telling Git to add a new remote location for my repository. And I'm going to call that remote location the origin. This is just GitHub jargon. They love to call it the origin. It's just like master. It's kind of a convention everyone's agreed upon. You don't have to call it that, but your life will be much easier if you do, because everyone does. It's one of those things about a conversation. Sometimes you just, you just roll with it. Okay, so if I paste that command into my terminal, where again, I'm in git papers, nothing appears to have happened, right? But what's so cool about git and GitHub is we can just go ahead and ask it what's happened. So if I do git remote, it will now tell me it has this remote origin. And if I did git remote v for verbose, it will even tell me where the origin is. So that's pretty cool. Okay, but all I've done is tell it this point in the wonderful internet where I could push code. I haven't pushed any code. And so git has this command called push, which makes some degree of sense. And so what it's going to do is push this U is, you only have to do it the first time, it's just saying to push up uh, your, your master branch to your origin remote. So then it'll ask me for my username and password. And there are, oh my God, there are different ways that you could uh, do this. I have 2FA on, I'm so sorry. Access. So I have a crazy long, here we go, crazy long password. Okay, so just as the username and password that you entered on GitHub, you can enter those right at your command line and it will give you this whole little thing where it tells you that it says I have my username and password. I'm going through all the objects. I am going to write them to this location and I'm going to push my master branch locally to master. And now I've set it up to track it. So what does that actually look like? So here, remember this was what I had before. If I reload it, all of a sudden, now my code is on GitHub. And what's so cool is if I look at the commits, they're exactly the commits that were on my computer. So, yay! Now I can actually let other people see what I've been doing. Um, and what's also great is I have a copy for myself. So if I had a home computer and a work computer, I could easily go and see on either computer what I had done so far. Um, this is really cool. So if we look at this commits tab, we can see the whole thing. And anywhere you can access GitHub, you can access your repository. So basically anywhere with an internet connection, you can access GitHub. This Git, where you're all doing it locally, doesn't need an internet connection. But here, if you have an internet connection, if you've got a browser, you're good to go. This is pretty cool. So now let's see what else we can do. We can also push other local branches into our remote repository. So if we do git branch A, I don't know if you remember, but we also wrote this paper with John. Let's just even do git branch, paper with John. What we can do then is we can do git push origin paper with John. Yes, and it will tell me that it's pushing everything up. And then when I go here, 
I can see that it's also recently pushed this branch paper with John. And I can even go check it out using GitHub. So that's pretty cool because now I have access to this version where it's both parallel copies that I wanted uh, alongside one another don't only exist on my local machine, they also get, exist on GitHub. And then I give you some information here, um, which we're not going to do, but just so you know, you could say, you know what, actually John's too busy, he's not gonna work on this paper with me, I can delete that branch. Okay, cool. All right, so now let's do something drastic. And uh, this is everyone's favorite step, right? Can, can I just yeah. interject uh, quickly, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, yes. give a little pause? What do you think is the best analogy to understand what a branch is? Uh, we've talked about branch, we've made a branch. Uh, the branch has uh, some of the history of the other things, but uh, some new commits as well. What, how do you see, uh, like you, how do you like, uh, conceptualize what a branch is? Yeah, so a branch is, we're basically going to consider it for now as a parallel copy where you can try out other changes. So the way that I describe branches um, when I'm working on projects with other people is I say like a branch is a, a sort of self-contained copy. So in this example, it's, you know, John and I talk about collaborating on the paper. This is what the paper would look like if John and I worked together. You could also imagine that a branch is, you know, I want to add a new feature. Um, so I'm going to make a branch where to a code base, let's say. So I'm going to make a branch just for that feature. And so this is the parallel kind of copy of the project where branch, uh, where this feature is added. Um, basically, anytime you want to have two copies of the same project and you want slightly different information in both, that's when branches are really, really useful. Okay, thank you. Uh, just as a side note, it actually doesn't actually copy everything, right? But uh, yes, that's uh, okay. That's yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it depends how you do it, but as we've done it so far, it's going to share all the commits that we made before we created the branch. So right. what it's doing is it's, it's saying like, we made all those commits and then we created the paper with John branch. So if we look at the git log for paper with John. Um, so remember, we can do git branch to list our branches, git checkout, paper with John. And then it says we switch to that branch, then we can do git log. And that's going to tell us not only do we have this commit where we actually added John, we also have these previous commits that we had done on our master branch. Thank you. So we can, we can see all those commits as little chains of commits and branch as a, like a going like from one of the commit, like a, another new one somewhere going somewhere else. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So if you think of it like a tree, it's that they share the same trunk, but then the branches literally branch off um, into different spaces and Thank they can you. have different information. And all those commits are living in one, this one repository, uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay, can Git save my username and password so I don't need to enter them repeatedly? Yes, um, I will give you some information on how to do that just after this. Um, how does the local and remote Git sync with each other? Right, so this is a really fundamental question because this is uh, something I think a lot of people get confused on, right? So Git and GitHub, GitHub is a remote copy or a remote, uh, like it's a company's servers to keep a copy of your Git repositories. But just because you make changes locally using Git does not mean that they're pushed to GitHub. What we did where we did this uh, push, that step, that is what syncs your local copy Git to GitHub. And then we can go the other way, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. All we're showing right now is basically how to back up your local copy onto GitHub. So just because you make a change locally doesn't mean it'll show up on GitHub. You do have to do that sync yourself by pushing your local changes to GitHub. That's a really, really important point. Okay, cool. Uh, I wanna be mindful of the time. So I want to go ahead and show you that this fact that it is kind of a backup, right? 
So I'm in currently, if I do PWD, I'm in this Git papers. If I, oops, can type and I CD up one directory and then I am now out of Git papers, but if I do LS Git papers, okay, I can see that this repository exists. So what if I wanna do something drastic? Let's say, you know, I've checked here and I can confirm that all of my changes that were locally are now on GitHub. If you're in that situation, you can do the following. If your local changes are not yet on GitHub, do not do this. Just watch for now. Okay, because remember, this is the, the drastic thing that Ross talked about where you cannot get them back. So if I do uh, remove and then the R flag for recursive, git papers. And I'm going to do it with an F so that I don't get asked all the time about deleting specific files. Okay, now if I try an ls get papers, it's gone, I don't have it. Uh oh, you know, what am I gonna do? I just lost all this work I put into my very important paper. I, it had a really great introduction. What am I gonna do? Well, because I have it all on GitHub, what I can do is I can do git clone, github.com slash my username, git papers.git. And now, if I do ls get papers again, everything is exactly back like it was before. This is so useful. <laughs> Just having a place where you can keep a copy of your work as you go is so, so, so useful. Um, I cannot tell you the number of times I've accidentally deleted something and been thrilled that I have it backed up with version control on GitHub or on Bitbucket or on GitLab. It's just so useful to have it there. Um, and again, because all that version history was up, if I go into Git Papers, not only is the content there, but I have the whole history of exactly what happened just as it was before. So cloning is again a bit of GitHub jargon, but what we're doing is we're just making an exact copy of the repository as it existed on GitHub. And so it's really, really nice because, yeah, again, we have the history, we have the files, we can see that all those configuration files are there, and that's what's really kind of encoding all the information for us. And even we can do git branch, and we can see that we can grab branches right now because we've only cloned it, we only have master, but we can actually grab other branches. So we can do git branch r that lists all of the branches that were on our remote. And now we can do git checkout paper with John. And now we've got a local branch paper with John that's gonna track that paper with John that we had on GitHub. This is really, really cool. Okay, so I just wanna show one more thing on this section, which is that this remote repository, once we clone it down, we can treat it exactly as our original local repository. So if I do git checkout master, going back to that default branch, I can go ahead and edit, uh, edit using nano my journal article. And I'm gonna say, oh, I forgot to tell you, I just got some really cool results. Really, really cool results. Okay, so I can then do a git status. I can see that just as before, I've modified, git knows that I modified journal.md, but it's not yet staged for commit. So what I need to do is do git add journal.md git commit. That'll pull up my little uh, editor where I can make commit changes. And I'm gonna say added results section getting really excited about these new results. Save that. And then if I check git log, I can see that this change was made. So what do I need to do? I need to now push, just as we did before, push this code to uh, my remote repository. 
And again, what I can do is origin because that's the name of the remote and master because that's the name of the branch that I'm going to push. Then it's going to go more or less quickly, depending on your internet connection. And then if I refresh this page, I can now see my most recent commit is listed there. And then again, to see it locally, you can do git remote v and it tells you uh, what your remote currently is. Okay, so just some key points and then let's break for questions. Uh, the first is that, again, this is the big difference. So Git is the version control system itself. And by default, Git is only working locally. GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or pick your favorite um, is a remote repositories provider. You have to sync them by pushing your code from your local version to the remote version. You can also pull in changes, and we'll get to that next. Um, but for now, just know that when you're making changes locally, they don't automatically go to GitHub. You have to choose to push them there. And um, if you go to a new computer or you accidentally delete something or you just want multiple copies, you can use Git clone to make a local copy of a remote repository. And then again, when you have that copy, it behaves just as your original local one did. You can make all kinds of changes and then you can push them back up to your remote repository. Awesome. Okay, so let's check in. Uh, okay, so it looks like all the current questions have been answered. Does anyone have any other questions before we move on to the next section? Maybe one very quick one. Uh, so you're saying there's this remote is on GitHub. Uh, what if my can I have a remote on a, an external hard drive or uh, somewhere else? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, can I have? Do I am I stuck with GitHub? Is GitHub the one true answer? Uh, GitHub is not the one true answer. So you can have uh, remote repositories, basically anywhere that you can connect your computer to. So, for example, um, you'll learn about Compute Canada a little bit later. You can have SSH, uh, if you can uh, securely shell SSH into uh, a server like Compute Canada, then you can commit create a remote there. Um, so long as your, your computer has a way to connect to another computer, it can serve as a remote. Remote just means that it's anything that's not on your local file system. It definitely doesn't just have to be GitHub. Ah, okay, good question. What if we change the location of the Git papers directory on our computer? Uh, this is a great question. So if you move the whole directory, will it still be in sync with GitHub? Yes. Because what, remember what's kind of tracking those changes is that little dot git directory inside of the git papers folder. If that little hidden dot git directory gets deleted, you'll be in a different place. But if you move the whole folder um, and it still contains that history, then yes, all of the settings, including the repository and the commit history and the different branches, those are all saved in that hidden .git folder. So if you move the git papers folder around, it won't, it won't mess up uh, your commit history or your ability to interact with a remote like GitHub. Good question. And I think Elizabeth, we had a question that I kind of pushed back. Uh, it's, it's basically I'm writing a paper with uh, uh, Microsoft Word or something. Is, is where do I start? Do I do I do uh, uh, Git and uh, do I version control those uh, those files? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, so I think this gets to the same question that we had just a bit ago about um, what kind of files does Git work well with. And maybe kind of let's let's look for a second and, and remind ourselves what's happening when we're doing a git diff. So I'm going to clear my terminal. I'm going to list what's in here. And then I'm going to say uh, journal.md. I'm going to do git. Uh, let's first, let's actually do a commit. So I'm going to say, okay, this is what it looked like. 
this is my second to last commit, I should say, copy that, and then I'm going to do git diff this second to last commit. Okay, so what git diff is telling me are these little pluses, which means these particular lines were added. If you remember, if I deleted lines, they would have little minuses next to them. So what this is, means is that what git is literally doing when it does a git diff, what it's recording is what lines, what lines were added and what lines were removed. This works really, really well for plain text files. So things that end in a, like, basically almost any non-proprietary format. So .txt, all your scripts. Um, here I have a markdown file. You can imagine all kinds of files that are plain text where this will work really well. If you have a binary file, so for example, if you have a PDF or a JPEG or a .doc, like from Microsoft, because those files are binary, they don't lend themselves as nicely to these clean legible diffs. So it's really, really hard to tell what exactly you changed in a, in a human readable way from one commit to the next. So if you want to have this kind of benefit of Git where you can actually see what you're changing as you go, um, it's really hard to work with a binary file like a .doc from Microsoft or a .docx. Um, then you want to think about, can I write in something else so I can have these legible diffs? If you just want the, uh, the ability to have commits, but you don't necessarily want the fine grained view into what happened at each one, I would say you're losing a little bit of the joy of GitHub but, and Git, but you can still do it. It will still uh, keep those commits, but it won't show you cleanly what the differences were. Does that answer your question, the, the question, JB? I think so. The person uh, controller who asked the question, but uh, I think it does, yeah. It, uh, it removes the ability to do, do those diff and looking at differences. Uh, it does keep like a, you know, a very specific hash of when what the unique file, when it was done, what, and what is the commit message. So maybe that's already a feature that could be useful uh, mm -hmm. in some instance, but only for small files, of course. Yes, okay. Um, there are lots of questions here, a lot around uh, specific file types. So with the diff work with Jupyter Notebooks, it's a similar sort of problem. Um, there are really fun solutions to that, which I would love to tell you more about, but it's, it's probably not the, the right place right now. Um, just know that there are ways to do it so you get clean diffs with Jupyter. Uh, let's see, uh, what would happen if someone else edited the remote file before I pushed my changes from local to remote? Would I overwrite the other person's changes? Uh, that's a great question. So this we're going to get into in the next section when we start working theoretically across these multiple remotes. Because remember, what we've done so far is we've just basically used the GitHub server as a backup of our local copy. We're assuming that nothing happens on GitHub, it just all happens locally, and we push it up there to have a backup. Okay. Um, if you accidentally delete the Git folder, can you recreate that folder and get synced with GitHub again? Uh, good question. Um, so what you'd basically want to do is you'd want to make sure that you set, um, that you pull down all the changes from GitHub so that you can then see the differences. So you would want to, yeah, yes, there's a way to do it. Um, I can, I can send you exact commands to do that. But again, if you get in a situation like this, what's really, really useful is to know that so many people have been in this situation before. And basically, there's that site like dangitgit.com, um, and obviously things like Stack Overflow catalog lots and lots of ways out of really tricky Git situations that many of us have seen ourselves in before. Okay, cool. So what I want to get into next, because again, I want to be a little bit mindful of the time, is Let's say not only do we want to use GitHub or Bitbucket as our personal backup service, we now want to be able to integrate work uh, maybe with other people. We actually want to have this conversation, not just with ourselves. So what do we do? So first, 
Um, what we're going to do is we're going to say that let's pretend for the sake of argument that we're going to have two different folders on our computer represent two different computers. For example, maybe your laptop and a desktop. Um, it used to be in lab, but now let's say on the other side of the house. Uh, so what we could do is simply clone the repository every time. But this is kind of inefficient. So if we make changes on one, let's say we make changes on our laptop and we want the latest copy on our uh, desktop, what we could do is every time we go over to the desktop, we just reclone the entire repository. This isn't ideal if your repository has a lot of files and you're doing changing a lot of things. So Git allows us a way to just grab the latest changes from the repository. So if you remember, we just did git push. This is the git pull equivalent. Um, so what we're going to do first is we're going to just do a little bit of practice run, pretending that two different folders on our computer are these two different computers. So I'm currently, again, in Git Papers. I'm going to go up one directory. And now I'm going to show that Git Papers exists. Perfect. All right. So now I'm going to clone. If you remember, Git Papers exists here. So now I'm going to clone that Git Papers from GitHub onto my local copy, onto my local computer. But because I already have Git Papers, I'm now going to call it Laptop Papers. So again, we're pretending we have a desktop and a laptop. Very fancy. Um, so I'm going to say Git Clone. As if you remember as before, Git Clone, it just, it, it's like clone in the, in the sense of uh, the common usage of the term where you make an identical copy. So github.com slash my username, put in yours, gitpapers.git. Now I'm going to call it laptop papers because again, we're pretending desktop laptop. And what's nice here is because I put laptop papers at the end of this git clone, it's going to clone everything into a new uh, folder called laptop papers. So it says cloning into laptop papers done. So if I do this LS, oof, so many things I have laptop papers and I also have git papers. Let's get rid of that. Okay. So now I am going to keep pretending that we have two different machines. So we actually have three versions. Not only do we have our two local versions, uh, we also have one on GitHub. So let's go into one of our local versions and add a figure section and push the changes to GitHub. So let's pretend, let's say that I'm doing this on my desktop. So I go into Git Papers. I'm going to edit my journal.md file, and I'm going to add a new figure section. And these are going to be under references, figures. So beautiful, really just the best. I'm really excited about this paper, everyone. This is, this is looking like it's going to go really well. OK, cool. So now if I do get status, I can see just as before that it's not yet staged for commit, but Git does recognize that it was modified. So what I need to do is Git add, and then I'm going to Git commit, add figures, my first wonderful figure. Okay. So now if we do get log, you can see this commit is here, clear my terminal, and I'm going to go ahead and do a git push. So if you remember what we've been doing before is we do this git push uh, origin master. And the short way to do that is if you've already done it recently, rather than doing git push origin master, you can just do git push and git will know that you meant exactly what you did before. And so now it'll say, I've pushed everything up and I've updated that master. So now if I refresh on GitHub, I should see that I now have this extra commit called add figures. Okay, this is cool, right? So now we have, remember we have three copies, our desktop copy, our laptop copy, 
and our GitHub copy. And now we know that our desktop copy and our GitHub are up to date. But what about our laptop copy? Should we just go to laptop and reclone the entire repository? Let's not. We could, but let's not. What we can do instead, so I'm changing into, I'm changing machines to my laptop copy, and then I can do git fetch. So previously what we've been, uh, well, no, okay. What we're gonna do here is previously we were pushing up changes. Now we're gonna ask get git to fetch the most recent changes so we can learn a little bit about them. So it's gonna tell us it fetched them down and now we have origin, remember that's the name of our remote, master. So let's do git diff origin slash master. And I can see that I've got these changes. So what it's doing is it's comparing our master branch. So this is a little confusing, right? It says that there are deletions, but the reason is because it's comparing our master branch with the master branch on the remote. Um, that is the one on GitHub. And what it's saying is our master branch, what we have currently on the laptop copy, does not have these lines. So if we want these lines, what we need to do is we need to merge in the changes from GitHub to our copy. And because we haven't been separately working on laptop because there aren't any conflicts. So for example, I could have kept working on laptop and had some uh, discrepant, like I, I could make different changes on my laptop than I did on GitHub. Because we didn't do that, it's gonna be what's called a fast forward merge, which is beautiful. It's always lovely when that happens. And what that's gonna say is, okay, I just fast forwarded, you've added four lines to journal. And again, if I look at my journal article, I can see these figure uh, additions that I made. All right, so in this situation where you know you haven't changed anything, you can actually do something even simpler, which is a git pull. So just as we had a git push to push our changes up, you can do a git pull to pull changes down into your local copy. And what git pull is actually doing is both of those commands we just did, where we did the git fetch and the git merge, git pull does both of those at once. Um, and so, Let's just look at it. So now we're going to start in laptop papers, which is where we are, um, our laptop copy. We're going to edit our journal article. I feel like this is almost ready. I think we should send this off to collaborators like tomorrow. Uh, okay, so we're going to add new conclusions. I have concluded something important. Um, we're going to save that. So we get status. We can see just as before, not yet staged for commit, but it is modified. So let's add it. And then we'll do get commit. Important conclusions. My initial important conclusions about this one. Save that. Okay, so now if we look here, we have this uh, important conclusions commit. It's not yet on GitHub. So what do we need to do? We need to push our changes from our local copy to GitHub. Remember, this is just the backing up. So we do git, git push. And again, because we had done origin master recently, going to default to those. If we refresh, now we can see that important conclusions are there, which is great. The backup worked. But let's go back to our desktop copy, git papers. And now let's do git pull origin master. So remember, this is uh, both the git fetch and the git merge. And the reason we feel good doing this is because we haven't touched Git papers in the meantime. We don't expect any changes there. We think it should be a fast forward merge. So if we do that, indeed, it was a fast forward merge. And we can do cat to show the output of this journal. We have our conclusions. And if we look at Git log, 
we can see this commit was in there. Okay. So just again, I just want to make sure people are comfortable with the idea that git pull is doing both these steps of git fetch. It's fetching the changes so you can inspect them just as we did with this git diff. And then it's merging those changes in. Um, and so again, you could do these separately. You could do them as one. It really sort of depends. Usually I would say it depends on whether or not you expect there to be conflicts. So if you expect that your local copy will have a change that you'll need to, to figure out how you want to resolve and we're going to do that in the next section. This would be when you'd want to fetch and then merge versus just pulling down changes. Okay, then we're going to get into everyone's favorite part, which is just conflicts. So I want to quickly check and see, does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, I feel like Tiana, your question was there from last time. Beatrice, it looks like JB is answering your question. Does anyone have any questions so far about pulling changes from GitHub? Is anyone just feeling overwhelmed at the amount of GitHub jargon we have learned, Git and GitHub jargon we have learned so far? It's totally fine. There's a lot. Um, and it just gets easier. Like I said, it's a conversation and you just get used to having it and it gets a little more fluid. But in the beginning, it's just a lot. Uh, when do we need origin slash master and when do we type origin master? Great question. Okay, so these mean very similar pieces of information, right? So um, origin is the remote, master is the branch name. What happens if you do something like git fetch rather than git pull? is it takes everything on your remote master branch and it makes a copy for you locally in something called uh, origin slash master. That's just the name of a branch on your local machine. That's why you can do like this git diff that we did. Um, the reason we need that then the origin slash master is because it's the branch name origin space master is just telling Git where to push or pull. So it's telling it both the remote and the branch name. Will you lose changes if you pull before committing? Ah, great question. Um, so if you have changes that would conflict with what you're trying to pull down, GitHub will, or Git rather, will be kind. Uh, and will tell you that it will cause a problem. So this is where something like fetch is really, really useful if you expect that you're going to have this kind of conflict. Um, it shouldn't just blatantly overwrite what you have. Okay, and then Bazil, it sounds like you're helping Beatrice, which is great. Okay. There is this uh, very interesting question. Uh, you know, what's the difference between uh, origin and then master and then versus uh, origin slash master? Yes, sorry, I think I, I think I answered that, but maybe oh, I, okay. sorry. No, no, I, I, was, maybe I, was, I, did. I did, because it is, it's super important. Um, and this is again, just to make sure everyone's clear, it's like origin slash master is when you do this git fetch, it's creating a, it's, it's putting it into a branch what's on your origins master branch is now on a branch on your local copy called origin slash master. And that's what we can do the git diff and everything that we did um, up here with versus if you have origin space master, what you're doing is you're telling git push and git pull, where is the remote and where is the branch. Um, and those are the two separate pieces. That's why you have a space there. Good question though. Okay, if folks are okay, I'm gonna keep going because we're gonna get into everyone's favorite piece, which is merge conflicts. Um, so merge conflicts are one of those things where most people, the first time you hit a merge conflict are like, that's it, I'm done. And you delete the repository and then you just reclone the whole thing but you don't need to do that. It doesn't need to be that way, right? 
Um, Git is set up so that you can actually handle merge conflicts directly in Git. Um, and you don't just need to delete and start over from scratch because that's not as fun. So what are we going to do? Let's say, let's intentionally first introduce a merge conflict. So I know that this is going to cause problems. So I'm in my Git papers folder. This is my desktop copy and I'm going to edit my journal MD. And because remember, this is not paper with John. This is just me. I'm going to say written by me and I'm going to say my affiliation McGill University. Cool. Then I save that. Our favorite best friend command, get status. I made a change, but I haven't added it. Also, just to show, if I tried to get commit right now, it would say I can't because I have no changes added to commit. So I have to add my journal.md and then I can commit and say add my affiliation for journal submission. Because we're getting so close, we're about ready to submit this paper to a journal. It's looking great. Okay, so now I'm going to do git push origin master. And again, what this is doing is telling git to push my local file changes to my remote called origin to the branch on remote called master. And I can do this. It says it pushed them up. Then if I refresh this, you can see it did add my affiliation. Great. Okay, this is very cool. Now, let's say that I've got it. So now I have it on my desktop and I have it on GitHub and I go to my laptop and I'm working on the paper. And now I'm going to say that uh, on my laptop, I'm going to do something where I say, written by me and all of my friends who are great. So this is not how you should add your author listing, but let's pretend this is what I do. Um, okay, best friend command, get status, get add journal, get commit, add other authors, add all of my great friends. Okay, and then we can do a git log just to see that this was done. And then we can do a git push origin master. And it says, uh-oh, you can't do that. Um, so this is the point where a lot of people see this error message and are like, that's it. I don't know what happened. I'm done. Um, but as is always the case with error messages, this is just one of those things where if you read it, it's very helpful. I will freely admit that there are many times I see error messages and I'm like, I don't know what to do about this. But Git in particular is really great about having very helpful error messages. So let's just read it. Let's just see what it says. Okay, it says I tried to push it and it got rejected. It tells me that I failed to push some references. We knew that because it was rejected. And it gives me a lot of hints. This is really helpful. This is what we need. So it says updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. So if you remember, I just pushed this adding my affiliation, but I hadn't pulled it before I started working and added all my friends. And so this remote has work I don't have locally, gets totally right. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same reference. Also right. Remember, I'm now currently working on my laptop copy, but I was pushing uh, changes from my desktop to GitHub. And they, those changes were already existing on the remote before I pulled them down. So it tells us I may first want to integrate the remote changes, hint using git pull before pushing again. 
I really hate long error messages, but I really love GitHub error messages because they're actually very clear. So what does it tell us to do? It says to git pull. Let's try it. I'm going to trust in the GitHub, the git in the GitHub. Okay. So it says, looks very normal, except it says conflict, merge conflict in journal.md, automatic merge failed, fix conflicts, and then commit the result. Okay, so remember, because it told me to do a git pull, git pull is doing this thing where it both fetches and then merges. Um, and so what it did was it fetched the changes and then it tried to merge the changes in for us line by line. But because I had changed the same line on both the remote copy using my desktop and uh, on the laptop copy, Git says, I don't know what to do about this one line. It's been changed in two places. You need to decide which one you want. So if I do a git status, it will tell me that my branch, this master, an origin slash master, remember that's the branch where Git is keeping what's on my remote master, have diverged and they each have one different commit. So what I need to do is look at this where both were modified and I need to figure out how I can change it. So if I do um, nano journal.md, Git has been really nice. And what Git is actually doing is it's telling me using these arrows and the kind of divider it's making with the equal sign where things are on both um, copies. So here it's telling me this is what's my most recent commit locally. And that's just by convention. There are a lot of conventions in Git. By convention, it's called head. That's the, uh, the furthest point along in my commit history is the, the top of the commit history, the head of the commit history. And then I can also see this commit, which if I look on GitHub matches. So here I see FC1A2, FC1A2. So this is the one that was on GitHub. So now I have a choice. I can choose to delete one of these. So I could say, you know what? I really like my laptop one. I don't want to have my McGill University affiliation. I could say I want to have all my friends, but I don't want my affiliation. And actually though, you could do all kinds of other things. So you could delete both of them. You could keep both of them. Git really doesn't mind what you do because what's going to happen right now is we're going to make a brand new commit, which merges these two together. And what that means is it takes the contents of what were in the remote master branch and what's in my local master branch and makes them kind of, if you think about the tree branches again, it puts them back into one kind of same, uh, same history. So let's say I want this, I want to keep both files, both changes. So I save this and now if I do, um, git status. It's going to tell me both modified. I've gone ahead. If I do cat journal, I can see that I kept, I went through personally and in my text editor edited it. So now I have to do, do git add journal, git status again. And now it says it all looks good. I can go ahead and commit this. So I'm going to commit it. And Git will say, oh, I actually am going to pre-populate what I think your uh, commit is going to be, that it's going to be a merge commit, where it merges these two histories together. And so I'm going to say that's right. Git, you're very clever. Um, and then if I do git log, I can see this merge commit exists. So I can do git push origin master. And now if your internet is good, it works, right? So remember when we tried to do git push before it failed, but now it works. We just solved our first merge conflict and we didn't have to delete the repository. It was great. Um, so now if I go and look on GitHub, I can see I have this master commit. And if I look at this version, I can see that I have both the notice of my co-authors as well as my affiliation which is pretty cool. We didn't have to delete anything. 
Okay. So what we can do now is uh, we can actually pull those changes into our other repository, basically our desktop copy. Um, and it's really, really nice because again, now we have everything up to sync with one another and we didn't lose any of the work that we had done in any location. So I'm just going to git pull origin master into my desktop copy. And because I didn't make any changes there, there's no merge conflict, it's a fast forward. So this is really cool. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause for a second and look at questions in the chat. Ah, okay, yes. So JB answered Francois's question, um, which is that, can you tell Git to resolve the conflict by just keeping the remote changes without going manually through the files? Yes, you can. Um, yes, this is just one of those things where, you know, if you want to, like if you, what do you expect? Do you expect that your work locally is something that you also want to incorporate or not? Um, this is definitely something that's really, really important if you're working with other collaborators. Um, and yes, there's also the alternative option to keep your local changes rather than the remote changes, which is just this theirs versus ours. Perfect. Okay. Cool. All right, I want to skip that one because I really want us to have time to do this. And this, I always think it's going to take less time than it actually does. Okay. So I'm going to reopen the chat one more time. Were there any other questions that people wanted to ask about just uh, working on different copies? Because what we had basically is we had one remote and then we had two different copies so this would be a way that you commonly work uh, with a co-author for example if you both want to work on the same repository at the same time and we even saw what could happen if you and your co-author have different suggestions you get a merge conflict you don't need to delete everything you can actually uh, incorporate all of the changes and keep everyone's work okay so if folks don't have questions about that I want to get to pull requests. And the reason I want to get to pull requests is that this is the primary way that you're going to work with other people. The reason is that because everything we've talked about so far assumes that you have right access. So what that means is that it assumes that you have um, control over what's merged into the repository. And that's often true, but it's not always true. And even if you do have right access, if you're working with other people, sometimes it's nice to, instead of just making a change, to suggest a change. Um, I really love the parlance is actually pull requests because you're requesting that someone pull your changes into the code base. Um, and so pull requests are primarily the way in which at least I, and I think most people, interact with other repositories on GitHub. Um, and so this is something you'll probably likely use a lot in your BrainHack School projects, and indeed if you're working with other people. Um, and so I think it's worth spending just a little bit of time to really get used to the idea of how do we actually make a pull request. Um, okay, so the first thing that you need to understand is we've working so far, we've had this system where we have our local copy and our remote copy. And maybe we have multiple local copies, but we always have just one remote. When you wanna do pull requests, the situation changes a little bit. Now, not only do you have your local copies, you can have as many as you want, you have multiple remote copies. And one of the reasons that's confusing is this is sort of like a just a, a remote thing. It's, it's a really a GitHub for the purposes of this talk. It's really a GitHub thing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to do it on GitHub. What we need is we need to make a copy 
of another repository on GitHub, not just on our local machine. So what I'd like you to do is if you could go to this repository. So it's called uh, EM Dupree Git Papers. Oh wait, no, you have a repository called paper, Git Papers, don't you? Okay, so let's go to EM Dupree slash papers. Cool, so if you could go to EM Dupree, let me just make this easier to see. GitHub.com slash EM Dupree slash papers. This is what you're gonna need. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna go to this URL, which I will paste in the chat. If someone hasn't done it already. Oh. Okay, go to this URL. And then what I want you to do is click this button called fork. So this is maybe the piece of GitHub jargon that is most confusing. Uh, at least in the beginning, it's like, why are we doing this? Because what we're doing is we're not cloning, right? Cloning is what we did when we had this remote GitHub and we wanted to clone an exact copy to our local computer. Forking is very similar, but the differentiation is that you're forking a copy from one GitHub account to another GitHub account. So now, if you do this, so let's say if I click fork, geez, um, I'm gonna put it here for now. Okay, it should show something like this for you. You get a fun little animation, it's adorable. Um, and then you can see that it should have your username slash the repository name and then forked from this place. Okay, cool. Now what we can do is we can clone that to our local computer. So again, we have to remember, we had the original emdupree slash papers, we forked it to our account slash papers, and then we're going to clone that to our local computer, just as we had been cloning Git papers before. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the desktop actually, because it already worked there. Okay, so I'm gonna do git clone. And then this is gonna be uh, whatever you had before. So for me, it's github.com slash this username. So it'll be your username slash papers and then dot git. And it'll say cloning into papers, done. So here I can see that papers exists. Okay, cool. So now what I want to do, oops, pull this over pull this over okay, perfect. All right, so now I want to make some changes in this new copy. And then I'm going to push them to my repository on GitHub. So this is exactly the same uh, workflow that we had just done with the laptop, the desktop copy. I'm going to do it now with this new one called papers. So I have some general advice for submitting pull requests. Uh, your mileage may vary, but I think it's really, really nice to keep PRs relatively small. Um, and also, like we said before, branches where you can have different kind of versions of the project running in parallel. Branches are also a nice way to keep that kind of uh, small changes so that you have in your mind like, okay, this is just a copy where I add this change. Um, so let's try it. Okay, so we forked it, we seed it, CD did. Let's go ahead and change into it. All right, and then I should see it's not at all unlike the one we were just working on. Very similar exercise. Okay, so as you can see, I have a paper here. Um, I think it's a pretty impressive paper. It might, although unlikely, that it's more impressive than the one I was just working on. So what I wanna do is I wanna make a change to it. So I'm gonna say nano journal.md again, and I'm gonna say reference to, make 
1979. Do something vintage. Okay. Seminal paper. Now, if I do cat, this new one, I can see that I just made this change. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, just as before, same workflow, get status. You can see that this was done. Git add journal. Git commit as a new, as a seminal reference. Somehow overlooked. All right. So now that that's added, what we can do is do git status. We can see that just as we expect, it's clean. So we're going to do git. Ah, let's do one more thing. Git remote B. Okay. So if you remember, what's important here is that we had done a git clone from our copy. So if you had done a git clone from em Dupree papers .git directly, you we don't have write access there. So we can't push any changes there. We need to make sure that this one is our copy that we had forked on GitHub. Okay, so this looks right. I, I do have write changes at this place called Unique Cow. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do git push origin, which is the name of this remote, and then master. Um, and so, just as before, it should push up, depending on your internet access, more or less quickly. And then if I refresh, I can see this new commit is here. And I can also see that now it's telling me this commit is one, this branch, rather, sorry, is one commit ahead of EMG Premaster. So GitHub has a really helpful thing built in right here, where you can actually do a git diff between two GitHub repositories. So it tells me, here's the, the one I forked it from, EMG pre slash papers, the master branch. Here's the forked copy, which is unique cal slash papers, the master branch. And it shows me what the difference is. If this what I, is what I wanted, I can click the big green button uh, called create pull request. And what that will do is it will open a new pull request back on EMG pre papers. So I can say, um, I can write a message directly to the authors. Because I only have one commit, it's automatically using the commit to fill in the pull request. And I can say, you should really add this one um, because I think it's important. And then I say, create pull request. And now I can see that I can come to this repository and decide whether or not I want to pull in these changes. Okay. I don't see any pull requests coming in yet. Ah, yes, here we go. Nice. All right, it would be amazing if everyone could make a pull request. It can be very small. It can be very large. It can be whatever you want. But it would be really nice just to show that you can add a pull request here. Perfect. Okay, let's go to the questions while these are coming in. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, yes, Basile answered this one. Um, basically, anything you can write in plain text, you can handle on GitHub. So, for example, uh, people who write their papers in LaTeX often use GitHub to um, handle the changes in those papers. Similarly, if you're writing something in Markdown, it makes a good deal of sense. Uh, it really depends on what you're, um, what you're working with, right? Like what kind of technologies you're working with. But you can do all sorts of things on Git and GitHub. Um, I have some more, come on, come on, I know there are more. Very cool. I'm very excited about this. Also, you should be too. I have a friend who says that uh, your first pull request deserves like a gong. So I, I'm celebrating 
if this is your first pull request, this is really awesome. And I will merge all of them. Don't worry, they'll all get merged. So you can say that your first pull request was successfully merged. It's very important. And if you have some trouble doing that pull request for some reason, uh, just uh, uh, please put that on chat and we, we're going to use your trouble to make sure that everyone knows about how to do it and uh, knows how to uh, sort of protect those troubles. Exactly. Yeah, so there are more than seven people in here. So if you are having trouble, this is definitely the place to ask or the time to ask rather. Because the last thing I want to show is basically how to do this process, but just on a new branch, which is almost exactly the same. We're just going to walk through it one more time because it helps. Nice. Okay. Okay. So while these are still coming in, um, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do this with a new branch. Same process. We're just going to walk through it again, just so you can see what it looks like. And if you have any questions, just go ahead and add them into the chat. Elizabeth, you're not uh, afraid that uh, people won't be able to actually both follow you and finish their pull requests? I think, I think because it's the same, basically, we're just going to do exactly the same thing, just with a different branch. Okay. Hopefully, it should help. Okay. But if you are having trouble, just ping in. Okay, so let's just walk through what we did one more time. So here we had, we were on this repository, which we wanted to make a pull request to. We clicked fork and it forked it to our local one, which in my case is, oops, da, 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 da. How papers. it will be your username slash papers. And then what we wanted to do is we cloned it to our local machine, right? So we did a git clone, just hitting up on my thing. Okay, I did a git clone, that address, that URL, dot git to my local machine, and I changed into that directory. So that's where I am right now. And now, I want to see something. So I want to see git branch. So if you remember when we did paper with John, we made different branches. I'm going to do exactly that again. So git checkout, the B flag for branch one more time. And then I'm going to say something like new section. And again, just as we learned for Unix, where you don't want to put uh, spaces in your file names or folder names, you shouldn't put spaces in your branches either. Okay, so we switch to a new branch called new section. And if we do a git status, we can do a uh, nano journal.md. So we're gonna say, brand new results section. Save that. Okay. So if I do my git, oops, git remote B, remember this remote should be my username slash papers. So what I can do is I can say git status, git add the file that I changed, git commit, adds a new section, details, brand new results. Save that commit. And then I'm going to git push origin, which is the name of my remote. Ah, but remember, we were doing master before. Now I'm on a new branch. I'm not on master. So git push. If I do just git push, what does it say? It says, uh oh, uh, the current branch, new section, has no upstream, which means it doesn't exist on the remote. So what we can do is git push u, if you remember we did that the very first time too, or it's just short for set upstream, origin, new section. And again, this is where git 
error messages are actually super helpful. This is exactly the command we need. So if we just run that, now it tells us we have a new branch. So, and you can see I'm at unique cal slash papers, have this new branch, new section. And then I can say, adds new section, detailing very cool results. Can you just a uh, little bit show yeah. again? Uh, what is uh, going to go where uh, on the uh, on the GitHub interface? Yes. So what I'm doing is I, I made this. I pushed it to my fork. So I had the original one. I forked it, cloned it to my local one. I made the changes locally. I pushed it to my remote, which is a fork of the original one. And then because I do that, it says I can compare and pull request with the original one. So I can see here's the original one that I forked from. Here is my fork. So it's my username, same repository. And now I can see the exact branch. So before it was just master and master, but now I can see I can choose, do I want it to be master or this new branch I just made? I want it to be the new branch I just made. And if I look down, I can see the changes that were on this new branch. And here's a fun one because I made, so this is another good reason to work on branches. Because I made this first change on master, you remember where I added reference to the seminal reference? It's also going to include that change on my new branch because I made that new branch after I made that change on master and I made that, uh, yeah, I made that new branch after I made that change on master. So now because it's branching off of master at that point, it still has that commit in its history. So if I want to make sure that all of my changes are really don't interact in any way, then this is another really good reason to use branches early. But what I can do basically is then just as before, just create this pull request and it will go to that one and it will include both the changes I made on my master branch as well as the changes I made on my new branch. Um, and again, if I want to avoid that, then I should make branches a little bit early or I should, uh, there are other ways to avoid it, but we will not talk about them because they involve revising history and we're not gonna have time to do that in the next 10 minutes. Um, but there's always more to learn about Git and GitHub and branches are your friend. That's maybe the first takeaway from here. We, we have 15 pull requests. Uh, I would love to hear a bit more from the people uh, who still are you know, working on it. So if you're just working on it, that's fine. If you are stuck on something, if you need some uh, advice or if you have any question, this is uh, maybe a good time to make sure that uh, you grabbed the concept of what is a pull request and how to make it. Okay, do I need to create a new branch to make a pull request? No, you do not need to. But again, this is sort of a, a matter of just, like I was saying before, kind of keeping your changes compact. It can get really, really helpful, particularly if you're making lots of different kinds of changes so that they don't overlap, like mine are in this, uh, this one I just made, because you can see it has both this commit, which is from my master branch, as well as this commit, which came after when I made a new branch. Generally, we want to avoid that, which is why I would highly recommend making branches, but it's definitely not something that's required to make a pull request. Uh, yes, how can you review the exercises? So that same repository that I sent at the beginning of the lesson has everything. It just puts you here. It also includes the slides that I showed at the beginning, as well as a few other resources that I found super, super helpful. Um, and it's also going to be linked in the course website so that you can see this will, this website is the materials listed under my lecture on the course website. Great question. 
Okay, we have nine minutes left. Does anyone have any other questions? Ooh, nice, 21, I love it. Um, does anyone have any other questions, either about Git or about GitHub or about maybe anything that we've covered today or that you kind of wanted to touch on? There isn't any question. Uh, could we maybe spend a, a, a few minutes, first of all, checking that uh, the understanding is, uh, is is good by everyone, and uh, uh, and secondly, maybe just reviewing a little bit of uh, what what are the concepts of uh, Git uh, and 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 GitHub, like you know what what are the main concepts that we've talked about. I think that might be a, a good way of uh, wrapping up. Yeah. Yeah, so if there are no questions, I kind of just want to walk you through the GitHub workflow that we talked about today. Um, and this is definitely one of those things where like as you practice, it will get easier. Um, but it's really, really nice just to have kind of the idea in mind about what um, what's kind of the typical flow. Also, this may be something people are hitting where if you follow the steps but the pull request button doesn't appear. If you go back to the original repository, so emg pre slash papers, and click new pull request, um, you should be able to make one from a fork. But, okay, so I'm gonna close this. But if new questions come up, just stop me. So what did we learn? So we learned that basically what Git is tracking, Git is really useful for version control and it can track uh, for plain text files the exact changes as well as a human readable commit history where you can see what's changed over time. And what's really nice about this is that you can uh, have an overview of your project and what's changed on a particular project. So in Git parlance, Projects are repositories, um, and that just means that all the files within that uh, folder are considered part of the same project and are all tracked together. When you want to uh, make something a Git repository, so you want to make a new project a Git repository, you first to need to initialize it, which is to tell Git to start paying attention to it, and then you need to add specific files as you make changes to them before you can commit. So if you wanna get a quick status from Git about the status of your project, you can type Git status and you can see what's been changed, what's currently staged for commit, what have you added? Um, and then if you wanna write a commit message, you can use Git commit. This all just updates the copy on your local file system. When you want to start working with other people, what you need is a remote that you can push to. And services like GitHub offer a really, really great remote. Uh, so what you'll do then is you'll go to GitHub and you create a new repository. There are lots of ways to do that. Um, from the main thing when you're logged in, you might see this little green button that just says new. When you create that remote repository, then on your local repository, you can just say, I'm going to add a new remote. And that tells Git that there's another location where you can keep your files synced. So for the purposes of this tutorial, we did GitHub, but again, this could be lots of other places. It could be anywhere that your computer can connect to. So it could be other services like GitLab or Bitbucket. It could be another computer where you have SSH access. Whatever your computer can connect to can serve as a remote. Um, so once you set that remote, you can then push changes to it and you can pull changes from it. And that allows you to get uh, not only the exact changes, but also the commit history that you've changed. You can also maintain on both your uh, remote and your local copy branches, which just if your history, if you consider your history kind of like, like a tree again, uh, so it's, you move up the trunk and then you get to branches where things diverge, but unlike a tree, you can also merge them back together again. 
And this is where Git gets kind of the graph um, model in its name. Okay, and then let's see. So what do we have so far? We have local copies, we have remote copies, we have pushing and pulling. All of these are probably the main workflow that you really need. If you want to work with other people, the other thing I want you to know, because it's so, so common, is pull requests. And just as we could pull code in, a pull request is a request that someone else pulls code in. And the way you do it is uh, on GitHub by forking a repository. So remember that forking is different than cloning, because with cloning, you're making an exact copy from a remote to uh, let's say your local computer. But with forking, you're making a copy in the cloud. So you're making a copy on GitHub of another repository. And then once you have a fork, you can treat that just like your other remote. So you can clone from it, you can push changes to it, you can make a new branch. Um, and then once you've made the changes you wanna make on that fork, you can start a pull request to the original repository where they can incorporate your changes. And just as an example, um, so oh, this is someone else's, but it will work just fine. You can see that this uh, pull request is showing me on GitHub exactly that I want to add this one other line. And those are the main pieces that we covered today, which were a lot. Um, it's, it's definitely not a small amount. But I think it's a really good grounding to kind of get started with the terms and to play around with them a little bit more um, because these will be kind of the major operations that you'll want to work with when you're trying to version control your projects. And it's really like, uh, like Elizabeth says, it's really like uh, you know, doing it a few times to feel comfortable. And Maybe another thing that I would long to, uh, we haven't insisted on, uh, maybe, or um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is you know what what really is a commit when you do like git commit. When you do git commit, you basically take a snapshot of what has what what is the state of your repository. And I think that's uh, very important because that's the things you are going to compare, and that's the thing. You, like if you want to go back to any commit at any time, you always are able to do so. So I think that's uh, having that the knowledge that a commit is that's one of those snapshots, and there are link. Uh, you know, in history, you can go from one snapshot to the previous one to the previous one, or you can branch to like a. So it's a graph of snapshots, and uh, and and I think that's uh, that to me was helpful to sort of play with Git when I uh, kind of a. Uh, so that this was just a, a number, uh, a graph of a snapshot of commits. Uh, it was, uh, it was kind of helpful to know, oh, okay, if I want to pull that thing, I would just like grabbing those commits that I don't have. Those are the, some nodes that I don't have that from my graph. Uh, so it's a, it is a way of thinking of it that might help some of you uh, in this, uh, uh, in, you know, in, in working while working with it, so that you have a little bit of a knowledge of what's going on behind the scene and just not uh, knowing uh, the, uh, the commands. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, yeah, so that's that. there are lots of different ways to present this, and it totally depends. So for example, if you go to try github.io, which is one of the resources I link, it will show you kind of this graph structure that JB's talking about. It will show you a visual way, which is really, really helpful if, if that's how you picture things, just to see. So I would definitely check out these resources as well.